Hey, good evening. Welcome to Montpelier Civic Forum. And tonight, we're going to have another in our conversation with the candidates about the issues that are coming up before votes uh, in November. And again, as I always say, watch all of these. They're really good. We'll have our candidates from Washington County State Senate, of which we have one this evening. We'll have Montpelier representatives going running for the State House. And we have the garage and we have the sewer bond issue that will be discussed. So by the time you're through watching these, I, I think you'll have a pretty good background. Uh, tonight, we, it's my honor to have Chris Bradley in. Thank you. Who is running for state senate in Washington County. If I didn't look crazy before, I'm removing all doubt now. Oh, no, 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 no. What, sitting with me? Uh, no, uh, running for uh, office is a minority party. How many times have you run for office? Never at the state level. Um, in the municipal level, um, I became involved uh, with Northfield Town Government first as a lister. Uh, what I, is a lister? Uh, a lister is a tax assessor. Okay. Uh, excuse me, a property assessor. We put a value on property, and from that, the grand list gets built, and from the grand list, taxes are derived. So uh, um, as a lister, uh, you are charged with looking for new construction, looking at existing expansions. Um, I enjoy, I, I still am a lister. Um, uh, I was elected to the uh, select board uh, for three years. I served as chair of the select, Northfield Select Board. I'm very proud that uh, during my three-year tenure, we actually managed to merge the village of Northfield with the uh, town of Northfield. Some, what year would that have been? Uh, that was, uh, oh my heavens, you're going to call me on this. Uh, I won't hold you to it. I'm going to say 2008 um, uh, that uh, we managed to get that done. And we had failed numerous times before, uh, just uncertainties on the part of the village and the town. Um, but we're now one unified Northfield. Uh, very proud that I was part of that uh, effort. There were a lot of uh, people involved. I've served as grand juror for two years. Uh, I've served as a water and sewer commissioner for three years and an electric commissioner for two years. So I've had uh, a fairly extensive uh, exposure to uh, elected office at the municipal level. But that's not your principal occupation. Oh, no. Um, my principal occupation actually uh, uh, started with the state of Vermont uh, years ago when I got out of the University of Vermont. Um, I was casting about, at the time I was an education major, um, and feeling very lost and watching school uh, uh, loans build up. Uh, a friend of mine worked at the uh, uh, State Information Services, CIS, in uh, Montpelier, uh, and I became a programmer, excuse me, a computer operator trainee uh, working for the state of Vermont. Uh, I did that for approximately three years. Uh, that gave me enough experience to become a uh, programmer trainee. So I transferred for the, to the Department of Social Welfare, was a programmer trainee there for, again, about three years, left as a senior systems analyst, uh, went to Boston as a consultant. Uh, so I'm an IT specialist. Uh, you have I, your own company, don't you? Uh, I uh, became, across the time, a specialist in a certain type of software. Um, as a uh, computer systems engineer working for that company, I realized that there was a, a niche a need for a product, and in my spare time, I actually got a waiver from the company that I work for, um, and uh, uh, developed this in my spare time, uh, and marketed it. Uh, it's still marketed through companies like IBM. I, I have a kind of a unique situation. I, I do development and support, and other companies sell my software. So I am in Northfield, Vermont, I used to have to travel extensively um, uh, all over the world, South Africa, Brazil, Singapore, Germany, France, uh, Canada, uh, to basically position my solution. Um, but uh, Networks is that company. It's still uh, paying, uh, keeping the lights on. In the meantime, I created a second company called uh, ACK Computing, which does uh, computer repair and consulting, both for home and business. Uh, so I've been pretty well steeped in programming and systems and systems development for, oh golly, uh, something like 30, 35 years. Now, what can the state government, you're, you're running for state senate, how can the state government improve the lot of small business in oh, Vermont? Oh boy. Um, I mean, you must know uh, personally on this. Well, um, I have not personally felt the negative effects of Act 250. 
But I have some really- Act 250 being? Uh, that is, uh, yes. Um, uh, Act 250 uh, was well-intentioned. Um, it was uh, a solid idea. Um, somewhere along the line, it became very difficult for a business uh, to ad uh, adhere to Act 250 requirements in a timely fashion and deliver uh, on a business proposal. Uh, I have a, a situation in Northfield. Uh, there's a fuel company in Northfield that uh, wanted to do a simple expansion. Um, it was uh, essentially a large pole barn so they could store their equipment. Um, one corner of this happened to be questionable whether it was in floodplain or not. The zoning administrator at the time said, no, you're fine. No, you're, there's no floodplain. Enter the Act 250 process, and suddenly a corner may or may not be in floodplain. And literally, this company has had to wait years. The building's up. It's already been built. But they're still wrapped up in legal costs uh, over permits, which should have just been a snap to do. So part of the, Act 250 needs to be streamlined. There's far too many review steps by far too disparate organizations to achieve a goal. We need something far more streamlined. How do you feel legislatively that the legislature can accomplish that? Uh, um, when you've got that intense amount of law, everyone has an interest in Act 250 on both sides. Um, well, as I said. Or all sides. The, I suppose uh, there's more than two sides. Oh, uh, there's plenty of sides. Uh, uh, I guess uh, you mentioned lobbying. Uh, I've uh, served as a lobbyist, a volunteer lobbyist, uh, for the past four-something years, uh, both in my capacity as president of the Vermont Federation of Sportsmen's Clubs, as well as past president and current secretary-treasurer of the Vermont State Rifle and Pistol Association. Um, perhaps by those two organizations, you can probably get the sense that one of my lobbying uh, interests is on fish and wildlife. Uh, as well as uh, Article 16 uh, What is issues. Article 16? Uh, Article 16 uh, of the Vermont Constitution is the equivalent of the Second Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. It is the article that uh, says you have a right to defend yourself in the state. It, it's a much cleaner version. Uh, in fact, it, pre, uh, it uh, precedes the uh, U.S. Constitution by a number of years. Uh, interestingly, a little bit of history, uh, Vermont actually borrowed substantial portions of Pennsylvania's constitution in creating the Vermont Constitution. The Vermont Constitution was created subsequent to that, a number of years later, the, second, the U.S. Constitution was created. So uh, the Article 16 of the Vermont Constitution doesn't have that messy language about militias. It simply is a very straightforward sentence. You have the right as a citizen to keep uh, arms for the defense of yourself and the state. A contrast. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on, I don't on either. guns. I've... But a contrast between how fast the gun legislation went through and how glacial the changes in Act 250. Is it because Act 250 has no crisis attached to it? Um, Is that I... why it's so difficult to corral those cats? I would suggest there's uh, a lot of emotion uh, when it comes to... Uh, things like Second Amendment Article 16 that just doesn't really translate well into things like Act 250. Um, Act 250... is like a toothache. Um, but potentially, I guess I'll, I'll use that analogy. Um, I, I tend to look... When you're talking rights, personal rights, and that becomes very personal to people, uh, especially when they're so clearly and eloquently laid out as to what... But is, is it the law land use a personal right as well? Um, at, at, its, well at its core and base. Well, um, Act 250's intention was to curb uh, speculative development of Vermont's resources, to hopefully stop uh, farms in Vermont from uh, being developed uh, because obviously properties is uh, a finite amount and uh, there was a lot of speculation going on. So Act 250 attempted to put brakes on rabid development. Um, and I think in that uh, vein, uh, Act 250 has been quite successful. But it put it on more than that development. Um, it's, it's, well, it's, it probably went a little too far. But uh, to, to answer your question, there's just not the emotion in the legislature 
um, over something like Act 250 um, versus, say, rights. And, and frankly, uh, if we are to progress through this interview, uh, one of the central portions of my campaign are not guns. I would certainly hope uh, that's certainly something that got me involved uh, in this. Uh, but after what had happened in this last biennium with the passage of S-55, S-55B? Uh, uh, S-55 was the package of gun control bills that was signed by Governor Scott on April 11th uh, on the State House steps. That's now uh, under court challenge. Um, and yes, I'm a plaintiff in that court challenge, as a matter of fact. Uh, there are actually two court challenges. One concerning just the magazine ban portion. Which is? Um, uh, the state decided as part of S-55 to attempt to control the magazines uh, the number of bullets. Uh, the, the container which allows the number of bullets that can go into a, a firearm. Uh, they, they attempted to stop the sale of uh, high capacity. And but high still capa allow that to be retained by people who already it, Whatever have. you owned, you right. can, could, could keep. And then another um, element of this dealt with the, um, the bump stock that would turn a semi-automatic into um, a, a version akin to an automatic? Um, another facet was the bump stock ban, something that the feds are going to take care of, of on their own. In theory. Own. <laughs> uh, no, they will. D Department of Justice, our president, Is Jeff Sessions, in fact, even the uh, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and Explosives, BATFE, um, has already gone through the initial process of public hearing, which is a precursor to their rules change. Uh, you will find at the federal level, in the things move slowly, granted, but at the federal level, they will consider bump stocks the illegal making of a machine gun um, because it does increase the, the rate of fire of a, of a firearm beyond. And the its, third element, if I'm correct, and you would know and I don't, the third element deals with background checks, yes? Uh, well, there's actually another element beyond that. Uh, background, universal background checks was a component, uh, and also an age change, right, or an, an age, age restriction uh, for uh, 19 and 21, uh, 20 year olds. And an to, educational requirement. Uh, yes, in. you, you yes. could, uh, a 19 or 20 year old could purchase if, at the time of the, they wrote the law, if they went through a hunter safety course, uh, which is a very basic course for basically how you handle a firearm if you're actually going to go out hunting. Um, it's not quite the same as a defensive, but really I, I'm, I would hope that after this last biennium that uh, the legislature is somewhat sated on their drive to more gun control, which is why this is not, it may have been an impetus to get me involved, but it is not a central portion of my platform. This is what we hear from the people on cons school consolidation. Mm -hmm. You know, that maybe the legislature is sated in terms of consolidating the schools. What's your feeling on school consolidation? Um, Force food, I, school I, I, consolidation. I, I, I do see the wisdom, at least in terms of a financial gain. If you take a look at the statistics, and I, I love researching things like this. Um, Vermont has is the fifth highest in the country for uh, what we pay per student um, across the nation. Um, so New York, Connecticut, New Jersey, uh, District of Columbia, uh, we spend something like uh, 20,000, no, excuse me, 18,000. How do we per compare to other rural states where you don't have the economy of scale? Um, uh, frankly, I think the lower ends, which are probably not where we want to be, um, are, are much lower to say that eight or nine thousand dollar level. Um, if you look at how we spend our money, a great deal of that money is in the administrative uh, administration. I heard of once our that schools. we the number of school boards that we had exceeded whatever. Well, uh, you start looking at these numbers. I, I have to say, I've got very mixed feelings about uh, Act Forty Six, uh, the school consolidation. Would you go to Maine and and talk about thirteen to fourteen districts? Um, I, I think we need to solve Vermont's problems before I go to Maine. Uh, but uh, if we're to, to really take a look at this, and I'll give you an example. Sure. Um, the town of Roxbury is going to merge. It has merged. It has merged, thank you, with Montpelier. Right. Did anybody look at the transportation involved? Because as you look at that merger, you go through Northfield both ways between Roxbury. I, I can't imagine 
uh, transportation being a fairly significant cost of education, that we're going to save a lot of money with this. Now, maybe Northfield with Williamstown makes sense. It's just over the hill. Um, I, I guess it, one of my concerns is that we're clearly seeing some problems with our youth. Um, How so? Uh, well, what explains things like Columbine? What explains things like uh, 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 Parkland or Newtown? Uh, we're both same men. Um, how does anybody come to the, the idea or the thought process that they're going to go into a building and kill as many people as they can? Uh, I, when I graduated from school in 1976, high school, Northfield High School. When I went to school, it was perfectly allowed to, and here we are talking about guns again, um, it was perfectly allowed to hunt on the way to school. You could leave your gun in your locker with the school's permission. In fact, the principal would come around and admire what firearms are being stored in lockers. You would go to school. At the end of school, you would hunt on the way home from school. It was normal. There weren't mass shootings. There weren't threatening actions. I can't recall any such things, and maybe, you know, it was my, perhaps, my youth. Perhaps now we have an infrastructure, a social work infrastructure within our schools that's making our schools more expensive. Um, well, I would suggest, I think we, we have a recipe, and actually Act 46 may be part of this, where if you put more and more kids together, don't you start to run the risk of losing groups of those kids who no longer feel like they fit in? They're the goth kids, they're the, the ones with the weird haircuts, whatever you want to phrase them as. I think you start losing people. And if we take a look at what's been going on with some of these school problems, I see issues with kids that have been left behind. And I do wonder... Left behind in what sense? I mean, we test kids to death in Vermont. Um, Are you speaking of left behind uh, academic... Dylan and Klebold at Columbine. Uh, clearly, we're... Well, there, there were all... Uh, you and I could speak of the day, but there uh, were always kids who seemingly were marginalized uh, in school. Yes, but they didn't go out and pick up a gun. That is and, true. And, 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 and but what can see we how as many... a state, what can we as a state within our own schools, I, I can see where school boards, local school boards are addressing this, but mm -hmm. is there a way that, that the state legislature can actually address that? No, I don't think the state can. This is, it's a multi multifaceted problem, and it really begins in the home, and it, it begins with the fact Strengthening that, families. Uh, strengthening families. We have more and more situations now where mom and dad both have to work, and so we have latchkey kids. We have kids that are not being monitored in constructive ways because mom and dad have to work, and they get home exhausted. Uh, yes, my mom and dad both worked. They were teachers. They knew if I was acting up at school before I acted up at school. Um, and, and maybe that is part of my educational background where I, I did my homework. And what, about the drug, what, what about drugs? The, uh, the prescription drug problem? Oh, good heavens. Um, big Pharma's got some problems here. I mean, How so? Well, I think uh, pain has been an ongoing, when somebody has a, a problem with pain, uh, that's, I think, where the opioid crisis really got its, its, its hand on people because they hurt their back. They, and, and, and basically, well, here's, there's a pill for this. And that's a, that is a problem across broad spectrums of our society and will bring, remind me to bring that back to kids because I don't recall kids having ADHD. Uh, if, they were not acting, if they were acting up in school, you ran them around at uh, recess and ran it out of them. You didn't, there, there's, there wasn't a pill for that. And here's another pill for this. And, and little Johnny is, is not keeping up. Here's a pill for that. Well, here's a pill for your back pain. And oh, my back still hurts. Well, here's another pill. Oh, don't worry, it's, there's plenty of these pills and suddenly you're addicted. And the doctor, if he was aware of the uh, nasty prospect of addiction, which I think early on they really weren't, um, but I think Big Pharma knew, uh, so, yeah, we have a real huge opi opioid crisis that is... How would you address it differently? Well, first of all, uh, I, I think you have to, to take this right to the families. Um, this is a very personal decision to get involved in drugs. Um, there but for the grace of God go, go I. I've never had that uh, urge for dependency or urge to 
lose myself uh, in, in a slurry of drugs. But there are certainly people that do, and a lot of it, I think, is societal-based. And uh, a lot of things are expected out of you today. Um, hey, in my day in, in high school, uh, boy, if you had you know a new set of Converse All Star right. Canvas sneakers, you were probably you know is is doing pretty well, and that has now radically changed to cell phones, and uh, I think it's very difficult for I would not want to be a kid today. It would be very difficult. You mentioned pharma. Yep. Pharma took a hit in the last legislative session, insofar as the legislature said that we would be importing drugs if the federal government gave us permission from Canada. Mm -hmm. What was your feeling on that one? Spot on. I mean, uh, I think uh, th this is something where a drug in bought, the same drug uh, bought in the United States is literally hundreds of times more expensive than the same drug in Canada. Uh, that's coming out of our pockets. And, and who is actually making the money other than the lobbyists and big pharma here in the United States? Uh, that's just wrong. Um, so yes, I would, I would urge our con uh, our, our Congress to, to be a little bit more uh, forceful on this. We should not allow Big Pharma to make these sort of profits. It, it's unconscionable. The decriminalization and partial legalization of marijuana in the last legislative session, what was your feeling on that? I have to say, uh, um, I, I was, uh, I think Phil Scott did a, a good job at delaying it as best he could. Um, However, now we're in a situation where we have all the negative aspects of legalized marijuana. What are those negative aspects? Um, I think if we take a look at uh, Colorado, things like edibles, uh, things like uh, uh, these things showing up at school um, in ways that you cannot immediately trace them. You know, How do you know the little gummy bears that your child is now munching on are, are real gummy bears or, or something different? Um, so I, I, one of the things, we're, we're in financial dire straits in Vermont. Look, I mean, before we step into that, because uh, I do uh, want to discuss that, uh, so what's the I. next step on, on marijuana in um, your mind? Well, uh, I, I'm going to say, and I hate to be party specific here, uh, but uh, the Democrats and progressives opened a door that was probably best left closed for a little bit longer. However, Even though Maine and Massachusetts had taken that door, and now Quebec. Uh, yes, all around us, we are seeing uh, the effects of this. Massachusetts, a border state. And then that was after the previous year where we said no, because we don't want to be a state where have legal marijuana when the state's around us. And of course, Massachusetts went ahead and did it anyway. Right. Um, and Quebec. Uh, and, and, and Quebec. Um, I think the time is, 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 it is right to take a look at some sort of tax and regulate uh, system on this. Um, and, and frankly, I would see this as being, uh, um, number one, you have to take care of the, the, the program itself and the law enforcement that's gonna be involved. Um, but I think with revenues that we can perhaps realize out of this, um, I'd like to see that split perhaps four ways. What would those um, four be? Um, education uh, to uh, try to curb uh, drug use in general. Um, uh, um, uh, medical uh, approach to treat, uh, medical treatment uh, for addiction and, and the like. I'd like to see some substantial portion go to decrease our deficit, our debt, uh, and some to law enforcement. I, I can't tell you as a lobbyist how many times I have seen bills come in before committees when it's very clear that you are going, the bill is going to put an additional onus on somebody. Yet they never, it's, it's very rare, you think, aha, well, we're, we're putting extra onus on fish and wildlife or extra onus on our law enforcement. This needs to go to appropriations to understand whether we need to increase budgets. Um, and how little that really happens. Um, so that a bill gets you're, passed. You're talking about unfunded, unfunded mandates. Oh, it, it just looks good on paper. How do you clean the lake? Uh, well, first of all. I mean, there was a bill that, that said we're going to clean the lake and there was undetermined funding for it. Uh, and, and they still can't agree. And, and right. frankly, I'm gonna be hard pressed, because guess what? As the fourth highest, and I'm sorry, I gotta circle back to this, as the fourth highest taxed state in the nation, if our goal is to be number one, then let's just bite it all off. But we're now at a point, and I, I hear it almost daily, uh, where Vermonters, the real Vermonters, the. Uh, are, are reaching a point where it's no longer affordable. 
I mean, when I, I, one of the things I did uh, um, in, as a selectman is I had the privilege of going out on Meals on Wheels, which is, a, a, I'm not sure if you're aware of the program, oh, yeah. um, but it's a program. If you'd explain to others. Oh, uh, Meals is. on Wheels is a, is a program that is uh, basically uh, you can sign up and food can be delivered to your house. And it is a way to, for shut-ins and people on low income to uh, be able to, 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 to uh, receive not only some, some visiting from, some, from a caring person, but also uh, a good meal so that they're not going to go to bed hungry. And, and that happens more than you might imagine in central Vermont or Vermont in general. Um, when you went out on Meals and Wheels, it was very difficult because your job was to stop in at lunchtime, give somebody this nice bag lunch that had been assembled at the senior center, um, and then leave. But you rapidly become to understand that these people, you may be the only person that's visiting that day. You can't just walk in, hand them a lunch, and, and besides which, you get a pit in your stomach because you're, you're realizing that this lunch is not just lunch. This lunch is going to be half eaten for lunch and the rest is going to be saved for dinner because that's how close to the vest people are and some of our most vulnerable people are our elderly and I'll be it's it's shameful that they are the most proud they do not want to seek what they think is 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 uh, uh, charity even though they're entitled to it so I really think, especially when we start looking at something like uh, a carbon tax, uh, 25 or 30 cents a gallon on home heating fuel, I believe today in Vermont, whether we choose to understand it or not or see it or not, that there are senior citizens making a decision between the food that they buy and the medication that they need. Education taxes are a major tax, a major state tax. Mm -hmm. Should that be based on property or income? Income. It has to be. In fact, I would actually take a look at what they did in Michigan, something called Proposal A. What was that? Um, that was, uh, they put it entirely on sales tax. We don't have that luxury here in Vermont. I would imagine that those people who are proximate, those businesses proximate to New Hampshire. As I said, we don't have that luxury to follow that model here right. in Vermont because we're already getting killed on our eastern border with New Hampshire because people only have to draw across, drive across the border and there is no sales tax. Right. Um, I take a look at, at a more equitable source of funding for education, and property tax isn't it. Um, uh, I see it as more equitably funded on uh, basically on income. Um, and I would like to Now, if we did that. that, what would that do to high-income Vermonters to see that sort of shift? Uh, I, what would that uh, do to our res uh, you know, a certain degree of our residents? You mean as far as them pulling up stakes and saying exactly I, I, well, keeping the second house in stow or, or whatever? Well, let's but, talk about that. I mean, uh, uh, clearly there's there are those people that see this as a problem, because you may recall this last uh, legislative session, they passed S ninety four. What was S ninety four? S ninety four was a bribe. If you're out of state, I'm going to pay you ten thousand right, dollars okay. to move to Vermont. Now they, as written, as passed. Uh, the bill allocated across three years, 500000 half a million dollars to this program. Okay, To a demonstration of concept. Uh, one presumes. Okay, half a million, of very, our hard-earned tax dollars. So let's, let's break this down a little bit. Uh, half a million dollars divided by 10,000, 50. So we are going to bribe 50 people to move to the state of Vermont with this program. And in theory, their tax revenues that they generate will be more than $10,000, in theory. Uh, very questionable in my mind. I guess I, I, in, perhaps that's in theory. I look at this and say, you know what? We have a problem here in Vermont with our economy. We have a problem with, with building businesses. What is what? our problem with our economy in Vermont? Well, so... Uh, or one of the problems. We could spend 30 minutes on the yeah, problems We of could our spend a, a great deal of time. Um, um, certainly one of the things is there seems to be an exodus of, of talent uh, leaving Vermont. Our youth uh, are going to school here and they're not seeing uh, the desirability to stay in Vermont for some strange reason. 
Now, against, against this and against this bribe, I, I would like to make the point that if you read Forbes magazine, uh, there was a recent article um, that was done, a study by uh, United Van Lines that actually looked at uh, the moving trends across the, the, the country by this nationwide moving company. Um, I read that article with interest because I expected, I knew Vermont was going to be in the top 10 states, departure states. Had to be, had to be. No, it wasn't in the top 10. It wasn't in the top 50. Do you know who, what the top destination state that, to move to was? Well, Vermont? Vermont. See, I would have thought it wouldn't have been because young people don't have enough to fill a, a moving van. Well, uh, uh, and it, it, this is obviously a, a, a very interesting study, and I think there was only 110,000 moves that were looked at, but I just found it interesting that at least by one nationwide moving company, the trends that they were seeing was Vermont was the number one destination state. And I, I think we see that in tourism, too. We don't really have to bribe people to come to Vermont. The issue, the real question is, how do you get them to stay here? Um, we are in, in education, and some of that is in trades. Uh, I think we need to look a little bit more aggressively at trade schools to, to say what, all right, uh, and I, I don't mean to only focus on manufacturing, but let's say GW Plastics in, in, in Randolph. They have a certain need for a certain skill set. Where in Vermont is that skill set being isn't that actually near, taught? Isn't that near Vermont Technical? Um, uh, Vermont, they're both in uh, Randolph, right. yes. Um, uh, is there a supporting program that's actually at the high school level? I mean, because Randolph has a Votech program. So I think we need to expand that and, and look at it a lot more in, in a specific study of what are the needs of our local businesses here in Vermont. If you're I, a low-income Vermonter, wouldn't it help if four or five years from now, the minimum wage were $15 an hour. What's uh, your feeling on that one? That was another one that was debated for a long time <coughs> in the legislature, and there was many different opinions. What's um, your opinion? I think uh, long term, obviously, if we can raise the amount of money being paid to people, uh, they're going to be better off. But you can't do that. I am a small business owner, um, and I can tell you that it, in order, the, the business has to make money to make that payroll to then be able to have that person go home with a higher wage. So either that business is highly successful already, and if so, they should be treating their employees okay. How do, does that business meet that payroll on their, if the law just comes down and says, oh, well, there's only one way. They have to increase their costs. They have to, this is what the widget I make, it was $10 widget, now it's gotta be a $15 widget because I need to make extra income revenue so that I can then have this additional expense of, of payroll. What's your feeling on health care, on skinny health care that's being offered in other states that doesn't cover a whole lot, that doesn't cover pre-existing conditions? They don't allow it in our state right now. Um, our state has requirements as to what health care plans have to carry. Would you allow skinny health care? I think it's a step that needs to be considered, yes. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm against forced mandates. Um, I've had to, as a small business owner, nobody's paying my health insurance. I have to pay my health insurance. And when it's, a, it's an annual struggle to make that, those payments and at the same time realize that there are people that are not, and I, one of the things I'd like to talk about at some point is workfare as opposed to just welfare. Uh, something that's been done in Maine. I, I, I would like to see a process whereby we raise people up, not by gifting them money, but by giving them training so that they want to pull themselves up by themselves. Um, it, you give somebody a progressive path up a work ladder, a uh, workforce, and there's going to be incentive for them to move up that ladder. Uh, I really believe that. Um, if you incent the other way, here's... And, uh, and don't forget, there is a limit on, on TANF, on temporary aid for needy families. You know, after, um, uh, after a certain number of years, you drop off. Um, then explain to me why, because why, why do we have what appears to be uh, repetitive within generations of families on welfare? Well, we why, also, are we, why are we breaking those, th th those trends? Uh, again, those refer to jobs. 
Uh, I do have one question. Oh, We've sure. got about five minutes left. Oh, no, no. You, we got to cut name, something. Next to your name is going to be Republican. Yes. And people who are watching this are either Democrats, independents, and there's, there's a handful of Republicans here. Mm -hmm. What does that mean to you to be a Republican? Fiscal conservatism and small government. Uh, honestly, right now, um, as and I've made it abundantly clear earlier on, fourth highest taxes in the state. We have, I believe, uh, in 2014, it was $3.2 billion of debt. I believe that's now closer to $4 billion of debt. Your and my share of that is $20,000. You didn't sign up for that. I didn't sign up for that. And I don't hear anybody talking about how do we address that? Okay, uh, how do we address that? First of all, we have to live within our means. Just like a, a business, I cannot... Well, we have a balanced budget every year. No, it's we do not have a balanced budget, please. We do not... How did we get $3.2 billion or $4.7 billion? Maybe? In our in, operating budget. Uh, no, our operating budget's fine. It's our pension plan. And okay. it, by tricks of accounting, you can look at the budget and say, oh, look at this, we're a great budget. And, and we have been running surpluses because... Our economy is doing better, and I, I, I'm expecting we're going to continue, continue to see surpluses in our budget. How would you address the pension, the teachers' pension plan, uh, we have without to, raising revenues? Uh, by cutting. Okay, where would you cut? Interestingly enough, uh, and I know this is not going to uh, uh, bode well because I used to be a state employee. I would like someone to explain to me why Vermont, Vermont that you and I both love, mm -hmm. has the fourth highest employees, state employees per capita, per 10,000 in the country. Now, the top three, Alaska, okay, transportation costs. Uh, Wisconsin, uh, they have uh, uh, community hospitals, so they, they have health care. And by the way, that employee number is not teachers. That is just state employees. How is it that New Hampshire has double our population, 1.3 million, we have 600, yet we have almost the same number of state employees? I, I, no, I just need this explained to me because I'm, is it because of the huge amount of human services we're giving away? And, and because, let's be candid, Vermont is a destination state for many people. If you're looking to ride the dole, and I know people are going to get mad at me with this, Vermont is a good place to go to because we have uh, some great social programs that will help them. So... I, I'm not singling out. Are there out. specific social programs you'd like to see cut back? In uh, I think, no. At this point, um, I'm looking at the per person cost to do what we do today. And I simply ask the question, how can New Hampshire run as a state when they have just about the same amount of state employees within 2,000, 1,500 as Vermont, yet they have double the population? How, how what, what, are, what are they doing differently? What are the other 46 states doing differently that manage to have less state employees than Vermont? And it is not an attack on Vermont employees. I just need an understanding of why do we have this lopsided number? We have to cut our spending. You cannot run a business spending more than you make. It is simple economics. I learned that very early on. There was all sorts of things as a small business owner I wanted to buy, but no. So as a state house lobbyist, mm -hmm. you must see this all, the, you spoke of it about 28 minutes ago, how you go into a committee and people say, I want, but I don't know how to pay for it. Uh, they, how do you change that culture in the legislature and in the governor's office. It, uh, darn, well, I, I, I will leave the governor's office. I'm focused because on they are part of Because they are part of the legislature uh, and they do submit a budget to the and, legislature. And indeed they do. I guess I, I look at, at, at so many things that are I just slip through the cracks when, when bills get passed because in a lot of times they're, they're done in a very hurried fashion as what we saw, uh, I saw painfully in this last biennium. Um, or they get passed on year after year in the legislative session, like school finance. Uh, yes, they, you know, you just pass the buck, and uh, or, or or the deficit in our uh, pension. I mean, this just gets shuffled on to the next. Uh, okay, uh, that's the what next. What's your legislative priority other than guns? Forget, put that aside. No, uh, Where, guns is not my legislative priority. Uh, exactly. At all. What would you, what would your one legislative priority be sitting in the state senate? What would you really like to focus on? Well, I guess uh, 
part of that answer is is somewhat simple because I know I can't make any wild promises. Oh, if I get elected, I'm right, going right. to do this. No, I'm going to be the minority party. I feel very much like I'm going to be in for two years of abject frustration and two years of running around being the little Dutch boy, trying to put his fingers in the dike to try well, to hold back would the you, water. Which hole would you focus on? Um, education, primarily. Uh, primarily um, I think uh, we have to do something there. The costs are, are simply unsustainable. Everything from having multiple plans for health care to some of the unforeseen... So you'd like to see the unified health care contract? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, actually, the NEA even came around and... Uh, uh, said that that did sort of make sense, and of course it makes sense. It's it's cl single bargaining statewide. You're going to get a better deal. Everybody's going to get a better deal on that. I mean, as opposed to local uh, people making up their own uh, things as they go along. So uh, there are any, any number of things like that that we can do. Our time's run out. No, thank no. you so very much, Chris, for being <laughs> my with great me. pleasure. And I'd like to urge everyone not only to watch all of these shows, but get out and vote and make sure your neighbors Please and your families vote. get out and vote. And uh, thank you very much for watching.